We're going to enter our study of Smyrna, but let's ask the Lord to bless us and open our hearts to his word. Father, I thank you that you are here and that you want us to understand your word. So as you have told us to pray, open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word. And we ask that in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Here we go to Smyrna. Once again, if you were flying by, that's all you would see. The green little part there is the ancient Agora. This is a close-up of it. In fact, walking through that is very sobering to me. Those are the actual Roman arches, and it reminds me of what they did in that town when the emperors began persecuting. They lined up all the townspeople, all the inhabitants of Smyrna. They had a Roman uh, troop of soldiers. They had the clerk of the city. They had a table, and they made everyone line up, and you had to come through this uh, entryway to the forum, and the forum was the center of the town, what you could see in that picture, and you would walk by the desk, and all you had to do is, with your fingers, each person would reach into a bowl, pinch this powder, which was incense, take a step forward, and in the presence of the town clerk, and the Roman soldiers sprinkle the incense over a little fire, like an oil lamp that was burning there, and you sprinkled it over it, and it would just kind of glitter and puff, and a little smoke would come, and you would say, Caesar is Lord. So it was just a whole line of people, all the inhabitants, they'd go, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. And they walked by, and when you walked by, the clerk just handed you a slip of paper. It was called a libelli. And it was your ticket to another year of security as a Roman. And so it became a process that every year the whole town lined up, everyone would acknowledge Caesar as Lord, get their little slip, and if any questions, they held it out. All of a sudden, as Christ's church began to grow there, the Christians would be in that line, and they would take the pinch and they would say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. I cannot put the incense on the fire. That's what began what we call the wave of persecution in Smyrna. And it's very interesting, the history of this, if you read about it, the, the believers at Smyrna would stand in that line, in that long entry to the forum, and they were thinking of, what if I mumbled and just said, mm -hmm -hmm. nobody would know that I would, I said, I didn't say Caesar, I'd say Jesus is Lord, you know. And so there was a conflict in the church where people were making it through the line with sprinkling, got their free ticket, and still went to church. And they said, how did you go through the line and not get pulled out by the soldier? And so believers at Smyrna learned the cost of being a Christian. They, some of them suffered and some of them went on to die. Uh, I'll, I'll read about one of them. By the way, these are the, uh, the persecuting Roman emperors. Uh, and the Lord said in, Ephesian, or in uh, Revelation 2.10, no, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. In fact, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested be faithful unto death, I'll give you the crown of life. Here's one. The Jews in Smyrna were violently opposed to Christ's church. They were blaspheming and persecuting the Christian. The event is not mere speculation. Here is the record of their pastor. Their pastor was Polycarp. By the way, Polycarp knew the Apostle Paul. And so their pastor actually uh, knew Paul, had been discipled by John, and was still the pastor when this event took place. And it was during the time of the public games. The city was crowded. The crowds were excited. Suddenly a shout went up, away with the atheist, because he wouldn't put the incense on the, the flame. And they searched for him. They arrested him, but the, the police captain didn't want to see him die. And so they brought him up, and they told him that the penalty for not saying Caesar is Lord is he would be tied to a stake. They would pile wood around him and burn him to death. And he said, 80 and 6 years. I have served the Lord. I'm not going to stop serving him now. And so they piled the wood around him. They lit it. 
and Polycarp burned to death at the stake. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That happened after this letter. And he was an example. Now, you notice it says in, in Revelation 2.10, tribulation, you'll have 10 days of tribulation. It's interesting that there are, there are, there are not only was it 10 days, but 10 periods and even 10 Roman emperors. It's very interesting, the more you study history, there were actually 10 Roman emperors that, that persecuted the church. The first one was Nero, remember Nero? He was terrible. Uh, Domitian, he's the one that exiled the apostle John to be on Patmos. Trajan, uh, whose great pillars are still all over Rome. Marcus Aurelius, that's the gladiator, you know? Uh, the movie Gladiator, that's Marcus Aurelius there. Septimus Severus, Maximius, uh, Decius, Valerian, Aurelian, and the last one was Diocletian. Now he was the best is, as far as his efficiency. Diocletian, who reigned from 284 to 305, is the only Roman Empire that, emperor that retired. Everybody else died. Diocletian was such a good Roman emperor that he quelled everything in the empire. He was an engineer. He built all aqueducts and cities. He built a city in what we would call Croatia today. It's right on the coast. It's visited Dubrovnik. It's just beautiful. All the cruise boats go there. His palace is still there. It's one of the things the cruise boats look at. He retired from Rome and moved there after he persecuted the church. And over 10 years, this is what he did, three things. He destroyed every building the Christians met in in the entire Roman Empire. There is not one standing church that the early church used that's still a structure. They were all knocked down, number one. Number two, he incarcerated or killed, he either put in jail or killed every pastor of every church, every messenger, the angel of the church that Jesus was talking about. He found everyone. The Roman legions went out on a, a battle against the church under Diocletian. Destroyed every building, destroyed or incarcerated every pastor, and finally destroyed every copy of the Bible that they could find. That's why, if you know anything about Greek New Testaments, there is not one complete manuscript that has Matthew all the way through Revelation in existence. There are pieces, in fact, 25,000 pieces. Why? Because when the early church saw the Roman legionnaires coming, they took their Bible, and they went, here, you take that. You take Paul's epistle. You take Hebrews. You take this. And they didn't have the copy that they had in the church complete. They split it up because Diocletian came through every church, destroyed the building, took the pastor, and destroyed the Bible. He was the most effective persecutor the church there's ever been because there's no complete copy of the scriptures that isn't torn up, there is no building, and there were no pastors left. He did all that in 10 years. Unbelievable, and that's what they're talking about. Well, what's the lesson? We need to learn to hope in Jesus when life is painful. God has not promised skies always blue and flower-strewn pathways all our lives through. What God has said is, what Paul said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So the Lord says, I want you to hope in me when life is painful. Verse 8 reminds us, because it says the angel of the church in Smyrna, Revelation 2.8, that's the word myrrh. And remember, Jesus that myrrh has to do with his death and his scourging before his death and his crucifixion where he died. In fact, even the production of myrrh. Do you know how they make myrrh? They go to the tree. They take, it's from the Arabian Peninsula, these little bushy trees. They take their machetes out and they hit the bark of the tree. Myrrh is the resin secreted out the bark to repair the cuts in the bark. And so myrrh is produced by harming the tree, by, by hacking it. The, the Arab Bedouins just hack all the myrrh trees and come back a few days later and gather up all the resin that fills up the wounds in the tree. So myrrh is even produced by pain, and, and it's such a picture. But Jesus was crushed for our sins, and the Bible gives examples of how to die triumphantly. Remember I told you every time I read through the Bible, look for something once, uh, because I was a pastor and I had to do a lot of funerals, I went through and looked how God chronicled the death 
of people, the good and the bad. And here's some of the good ones. Uh, Jacob dies trusting the promises of God. You ought to read in Genesis 47 what he says. He calls God his shepherd that shepherded him all the way through his life. He said, Jacob, the patriarch, he says, God has been the shepherd I've followed all through my life. That's what he said on his deathbed to his kids gathered around him. Uh, Joseph, I mean Joseph, the, the one, you know, the prince of Egypt, Joseph, he sits in bed and blesses all of his descendants and then asks them to carry his bones to the promised land. He believed God's promises so much. That's a great account. David dies exhorting his family to follow the Lord in 1 Kings 2. Stephen dies praising God and saying, I see this, the Son of Man. And it says Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. In other words, Jesus stood up to welcome his martyr Stephen home. What a beautiful account. Paul dies, and we all know that one, finishing the course. He said, I fought a good fight. Peter says, I'm going to soon die. I want to stir you up by way of remembrance. Now, when I was a pastor, I used to encourage the congregation. I would say, you need to write out your testimony and your favorite hymns and your favorite verse so that at your funeral, someone can read how you came to Christ, your favorite parts of the scripture, and uh, hymns. And I started that when I was at Grace Community. When I worked for John MacArthur, my first assignment was I had 864 senior citizens. The youngest person in the class was over 65, and I had almost 900 of them in one class. That's how big the church was. And so I went to them. I said, okay, I'm going to eventually do your funeral. I'd like you to write your testimony, how you came to Christ, your favorite hymns and favorite scripture. You know what they all said? Oh, I'm not that old. Nobody thinks they're going to die. Nobody thinks they're old enough to die. And so I began doing a funeral every week. That's how fast, I mean, I always had a couple that were on, you know, respirators and a couple that were in chemo and a couple that were in ICU. And it was just, I mean, it was just amazing. Bonnie and I would be with all these dear saints as they died. And finally, one of them, the wife says, hey, my husband did what you said. Here's the paper. And he said, I want this read at my funeral. And he said, and he told his whole testimony of how he had been in the war and, you know, someone shared the gospel with him and he came to Christ. And he said, and I am dying trusting in Jesus Christ. Well, that changed everything. When I read that at the funeral, they all got busy. They thought it was so neat to hear at their funeral, not the pastor saying this person's a Christian, but their own personal testimony read and so I said, every song we're singing is what Bill wants us to sing. And every scripture we're reading is what Bill were his favorite. And so the example is kind of like Peter reminding the saints. He says, my time to go is soon coming, but I want you to be ready after I go. And of course, Christ died. Remember, on the cross, looking to the thief. And he actually is soul winning as he's dying. And what an example to us it is. Uh, I write for you, and in your notes, um, what page are we on now? 90, 100, anybody? 102? Good. What? 107? I wrote in your notes what I call a biblical perspective on persecution of believers. You know what it says in 2 uh, Timothy 3.12, yea, all that are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it's part of the plan that we're going to suffer. I went to Michigan State University um, in 1976. And I was sitting in my first class, 600 kids. So imagine six times this group, or uh, five and a half times. And we're in this giant amphitheater and the professor's down there, and, and he says, it was English literature, and he says, one of my goals as a professor at Michigan State University is to dispel the myth of Christianity. He says, Christianity is mythology. Now, they reverse seated us, so the start of the alphabet was in the very back top row, you know, so the A's and B's, so I was up there. And it's my first class, and the professor just said, Christianity is mythology. And my mother always taught me, you never interrupted people in school, you always raised your hand. So here I am sitting way up there, and I went, sitting in my seat. And Mr. Professor was carrying on ranting about mythology of Christianity, and he finally went, he said, 
Is that a hand up there in the front? He said, you don't need to raise your hand, son. He said, just stand up and blurt out what you want to say. So I stood up and I said, Christianity is not mythology. I believe the Bible. And I sat down. That's all I said. Scared to death. 600 kids. Well, he just, he didn't say anything. He just went. (coughs) Now, I won't even. He was weird. He wore his shirt open down to his navel, big, fat, hairy chest, unicorn horn hanging on a chain. He wore shorts, he was a man, that were too short for a man to wear. They were disgustingly short, and they had a cut all the way up to his belt, so you could, that was gross. And so, and he smoked, that was back when people smoked. He had his cigarette, not where normal people have it, he had it I know no one smokes anymore, but he had his cigarette through his little finger, and that's how he smoked, in his little shorts, you know, walking around the the stage. But when I said that, he threw his cigarette on the floor and went, (coughs) did you know as soon as class was over, at least 50 kids up to the balcony where I was, and he said, oh, we're Christians too. Let's have a Bible study. How did you do that? We wanted to say something. And I said, I just, if no one else was going to say the Bible's true, I thought I would. But I said, I was scared to death. And they said, thank you. And we, we started our Bible study at Michigan State University. Did you know, if you are godly in Christ Jesus and you tell anybody about it, you will get the, <coughs> but you know what? It's part of the plan. So, Persecution is inevitable. That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Second, we're called to participate in the sufferings of Christ. That's what it says in Acts 5.41. And God promises wonderful treasures to those that face persecution. My wife and I, uh, after we get done uh, teaching in New York, and then we teach in uh, um, Greece, and then we do Turkey, and then the next one we do is a church history class, and we're actually tracing the life of the great uh, reformers and people in the United Kingdom. And one of them is John Bunyan that wrote what? There you go. The most widely read book and the most widely printed book next to the Bible in the history of the world. For 200 years it's been in print and hundreds and hundreds of millions of copies. But John Bunyan wrote that in prison. He was in prison for Christ and his wife and his blind daughter and his other children were nearly starving to death while he was suffering in jail. And you know what he writes about? What Isaiah 57 says? There are wonderful treasures to those who face persecution. Fourthly, God uses persecution for his purpose. You know what Acts Acts chapter 8 says? When Paul was persecuting the church, He drove all the believers out of Jerusalem. And you know what the scriptures say in in Acts 8, verse 4? And they that were persecuted went everywhere preaching the gospel. What happened is when they were in Jerusalem, the Christians were all just concentrated in Jerusalem, thousands of them. And nobody was going on missions trips. But when God sent persecution, they were driven out of town and it spread the gospel to the ends of the world. And that was really when the gospel just started going global is after the persecution starts. So there's great, great purpose. And and fifthly, God says the proper response in the face of persecution is that we cause people to glorify God when they see our good works. The Roman emperor, Diocletian, when he was doing his systematic killing, why he retired as emperor was he couldn't extinguish the church. He would send legionnaires out to go and, and basically what they did back then in, in the Roman province of Asia, they would line the people up on the edge of the cliffs and they would say, either renounce Christ or we're going to push you over the edge to your death. You're going to fall down and hit the rocks and crash and die. And they wouldn't. And the Roman legionnaires were pushing these people that were singing, that were sharing the gospel with them, that were praying that had radiant smiles, and they say, you might push me over the edge and my body will be crushed, but I will go to be with the Lord, which is far better. And after doing that all day long, legionnaires started saying to the people in the line, 
before I push you over, how did you get to be this happy? <laughs> Why are you not afraid? And they started leading the soldiers to Christ. And the emperor found he was, he was losing more soldiers than it was worth, so he just retired. He went to Croatia or Dubrovnik or wherever he lived. And that's, that was the proper response. So basically, Smyrna, the whole letter is about ending well. The last one we're going to see today is the church at Pergamos. That's chapter 2, uh, and starting in verse 13. The lesson that we're looking at is when believers compromise Christ's call to personal holiness. And so here's the letter. The letter to Pergamos is to the angel, the messenger, the pastor, the elder in charge of that church, write. And this is what that leader of the church undid the scroll that Jesus dictated that John wrote down that was mailed to them. These things says he that has the sharp sword with the two edges. What does that sound like? Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. So Jesus said, I'm the one who uses my word. I have the sword of the spirit, the word of God. So Jesus said, I'm the one that uses the word. That's his title. The commendation, I know your works, where you dwell. Now look at what this verse says, even where Satan's seat is, where Satan dwells. Did you know Satan is not omnipresent? At that particular time, this city had a gigantic stone altar shaped like a throne. And it was on, the, the picture I'm going to show you in a minute, it's on the side of a hill in the middle of Turkey, and this giant altar, and on top of it a throne, and it was called the throne of Zeus the king of the gods. Well, Satan, obviously, Jesus said, liked it so much that he was hanging out, probably sitting on that throne, kind of like saying, I'm the real king of the gods. I'm the god of this world. So Jesus reveals where Satan was at that particular time, even where Satan's seat is. He likes Zeus's throne. And you hold fast my name and have not denied the faith, even in the days when Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. And that's what I was telling you, in the same persecution where Smyrna was, were doing this, they were doing the same thing here in Pergamos, and Antipas was put inside that, that brass idol and was killed. The letter continues, I have a few things against you. You have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. That's Numbers 22. You know, you know Balaam, this whole concept of Balaam. Balaam wanted to die the death of the righteous. He just didn't want to live the life of the righteous. Do you remember Balaam? He was a prophet for hire. And Balaam, with his own mouth, said, let me die the death of the righteous. In other words, I want to go to heaven. But he seduced the children of Israel to commit fornication. And so he was immoral. He was a bad prophet. He taught their enemies how to ruin Israel. So that doctrine of Balaam was present in Pergamos, caught, taught Balak, the, the king, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We already bumped into them in Ephesus, the Nicolaitans, Nikelao, the power over the people, which things I hate. See, the Lord hates, and this is, this is, uh, Historically, the Nicolaitans were the ones that believed that the clergy were elevated and had power, and the laity, the people, had no power, which is the background for what we call Roman Catholicism. Now, I'm going to talk about Roman Catholicism a little bit here, because this church is the beginning of where evil was becoming part of the church. And the history of Roman Catholicism is that after Diocletian, Constantine came, an emperor of Rome, and Constantine was facing a battle at the Milvian Bridge over the Tiber River, and he had his legions, and there was uh, another emperor with his legions, and they were both generals, and Constantine was afraid of going to battle, and so he had a dream, and in his dream, this is all written down in history, he saw... A, a cross with flames, and he heard the words in hoc signe vince. He heard them in Latin, that's Latin. In hoc, in this, signe, this sign, vince, you'll win. So the cross he, he took as kind of like a picture of victory, 
and he had crosses painted on all of his legionnaires' shields. So they went into battle as Roman legionnaires with crosses on their shields, and he won. He won the battle. And so what he did is he legalized Christianity. And, and what he said is, we're not going to kill him anymore like Diocletian was. I'm going to make it legal, but this is what I'm going to do. I have all the gods of Rome and the Pantheon and all the gods of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and Ashtoreth and everybody else, and they're going to stay gods. I'm just going to add Christianity to it. Have you ever wondered where beads in Roman Catholicism comes from? There are no beads in the New Testament. There are no burning candles. There are no idols to saints that you put in your car to keep you safe when you're driving. There are no... Where did Lent come from? You ever heard of Lent? The 40 days of Lent? Ash Wednesday, you know, Mardi Gras, Fat Thursday, and, and the whole thing of Lent. Where did all that come from? All of that is Roman paganism that was already in Roman religion. And Constantine merged the paganism of Rome with the church of Jesus Christ. And he just said, all of you are legal now. And so basically, all the priests of paganism and all the pastors of the churches that were left and survived were all legal, and they all set up shop. And basically, those that had the Balaam error and those that had the Nicolaitan error just merged right in with the church. And what I tell people, when, I, when uh, people say, what do you do? I say, oh, I teach the Bible. And they go, um, well, I'm Catholic. A lot of them, no, a lot of them will say, I'm Roman Catholic, because, you know, they don't want me to, to talk to them, and they're trying to defend themselves. They go, oh, I'm Catholic, I'm just not Roman Catholic. And they look at me and they go, what's the difference between Catholic and Roman Catholic? And I tell them that the church Jesus Christ started that's in the New Testament was merged with Romanism. Catholic means the universal, the holy universal church Jesus started. Roman Catholic is that merging in of all the beads and the candles and the orders of priests and the headdresses they wear and Lent and the whole sacramental system. All of that merged in. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Well, the same thing, let him hear what the Spirit says, and to him that overcomes I'll give to eat the hidden manna. I'll give him a white stone, and the stone will have a new name that no one knows except the one that receives it. Now, this... this uh, that's the base where those trees are of that giant altar I told you about that had the chair on top of it, the seat of Zeus. Do you know where it is today? Hitler imported it, and it's in Berlin. See, Adolf Hitler was very satanic, and that seat of Zeus was vital to him because he was an occultic practitioner. But it happens to mark where Satan at that particular time was hanging out. Uh, Pergamos also has uh, idols. Uh, the symbol for medicine, you know, the Aesculapius, the entwined snakes. You ever gone to doctor's office and seen those snakes around a pole? That is a portrait of the healing god, Aesculapius. Uh, when Bonnie and I take groups through this city of Pergamos on Holy Land trips, we go through the Aesculapium. And, and show people what it is. It's a tunnel like this, and you walk through, it's like a drainage pipe, real low ceiling, very dark. You're walking on a floor, and every six feet, there's a, a porthole in the roof of the of tunnel you're walking through where the practitioners would whisper, um, you know, the Aesculapian people would whisper down to the people, and what they did to get healed is they laid on the floor in that tunnel and had snakes crawl over them. That was going to the doctor at that city because they believed that the snake had healing power and they would have the people take these um, drugs that would put them in a stupor. They'd lay on the ground, snakes would crawl over them, and the priests would whisper words from up above. That's the, the occultic power of the city. And what the Lord says in chapter 2, verse 14, you have those that that do things to idols. Balaam made them take things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality. And you have people in the church that are pulling in the Aesculapius stuff, the pagan, idolatrous, occultic stuff, and bringing it into the church. And that's a danger 
a lot of churches, in fact, when you travel the mission field, there are a lot of syncretistic, the word syncretism means you blend together pieces of a lot of different things. Syncretism is you take a little bit of paganism, you take a little bit of Christianity and you throw in a little cultural stuff and you kind of have a church that's localized for that group of people. Christ said, no, I don't want blending with the idols. The next thing that we see there uh, is this inscription, that little pillar you see up there, is an example of a white stone. This lines the main entry to Pergamum. And what happened is people that were notable, the, the king of Pergamum would put a white marker up and put their name on it and what was good. And that's why Jesus said in verse 17, he said, um, he that has an ear, uh, listen to what I'm saying, and I will give hidden manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on it. The highest honor in Pergamum was to have your name on a white column. And Jesus said, I have a higher honor. I will give you in heaven a new name that nobody else knows, and it's just your access to me. It's just an amazing promise of intimacy that resonated with them because they grew up in a city where only a few people got their name on one of those columns, so it's just amazing. Okay, Pergamum, though, is our connection. What page have I gotten to here? Someone, whoever finds it. 118, 118. Pergamum connection is where Babylon, ba Balaam, and the beast and final world religion all are connected. You say, what's going on? Pergamus is the first church that began allowing idolatry into the church. Images of saints, uh, like uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in New York, any of you, are, or St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, the big one, is it Paul? It's Patrick, St. Patrick. It, Paul, it has the, every idol, every one of the saints are in there. And you can go to see St. Christopher and St. Everybody. And, and what has happened in Roman Catholicism is that they have ascribed to the saints and to Mary the attributes of God. You say, what does that mean? Well, what's praying the rosary? It's saying, you know, Holy Mother or, or Mary or whatever, help me. Now, wait a minute. I'm standing inside the Tice Academic Center, and if I'm a Roman Catholic, I can take my rosary and ask Mary's help, where is Mary? Well, she's supposedly at the right hand of the throne of Christ in heaven. But she can hear me saying my rosary in the Tice Center up there? That's saying she has omnipresence. It also says that that she can hear every Roman Catholic anywhere on the planet at all times doing that. That means she's omniscient. She knows everything going on everywhere. And if she can help him, she's omnipotent. You see, what Roman paganism has done is ascribed to humans the attributes of God. How did all that start? It started here. God, his plan has always been counterfeited by Satan. That's what Paul said. He said Satan in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen is an angel of light. Satan isn't wearing red tights and having a pointy tail and a pitchfork. That is not. He is an angel of light. There was a book written by a Mormon later named is Betty Eady, and it was called Embrace by the Light. And she went around and took all these interviews of people and, and asked them when they were on their deathbed in surgery, you know, and they're one of these people that died and then they you know, defibrillated them and they came back. She said, what did you see? And they always said they saw this shaft of light and they saw hands saying, come. And these people were not Christians and they were Hindus and they were Buddhists and they were Mormons and they were anything. And all of them saw the same thing at death. They saw this, this white glowing hands out saying, come, come, come. And she said, so you need to be embraced by the light. Well, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 11? He said, watch out, because even, verse 14, no wonder, for Satan himself transforms him into an angel of light. And so Satan's goal is to counterfeit the truth. If I wanted to make fake money, you know, I wouldn't make a red $20 bill. Would you take a red $20 bill from me? You go, no, I don't want that. It's fake. It's it's not supposed to be red. It's supposed to be green. Counterfeiters get as close as they can to the real thing. 
The real danger your generation is going to have, I'm glad that you're at Word of Life, because most people in most churches cannot defend what they believe. Now, they know, they, they have their hero, you know, whoever their pastor is, and they'll go, well, whatever he says, you know, that's what I believe. But they can't, from the scriptures, defend what they believe. And that is a danger because Satan doesn't give out red $20 bills. He gives out green ones. He counterfeits by just slightly. Do you know what rat poison, you know, when you have mice in your house and you go down and get poison for the mice and put it out, you know, in your attic or something, do you know what it is? It's 99% point something good grain, like wheat. But they just put 0.2% rat poison. Coumadin, actually, is what they use on them, which makes them bleed. And those poor rats bleed to death in your walls and they shrink and shrivel up and they're gone. But how do they get them? They, they have 99 point whatever percent good grain with poison. That's what Satan does. He takes a lot of truth and just adds that layer of error. Jesus said there's only two choices, only two destinations in Matthew 7. There's the broad gate, which many are on, and the narrow gate that few find. Jesus was very negative about the visible church. He says in Matthew 7, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we, weren't we in church? And he says, yeah, huh, you were. But I never knew you personally. Depart from me. In fact, the worst four words in the Bible are, I never knew you. you you've heard of four-letter words? There are four words that are the worst. I, Jesus said, never knew you. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself whether you're in the faith. Make sure you're really a Christian. So that begins with Satan's counterfeit. There are many people that are deceived by false doctrine. Genesis 4 contrasts Satan's follower, Cain, with God's follower, Abel. Cain gave his works. Abel offered by faith what God asked for. Cain gave his best produce. Abel said, God wants me to sacrifice a substitute, an animal, shed its blood. And it said God was pleased with Abel's offering and God was displeased with Cain's offering. And that's the two divisions. It's the, the religion of the world is human achievement. I'm going to go to Mecca the Muslims say. I'm going to do the sacraments, the Catholics say. I'm going to knock on doors, the Jehovah's Witnesses say. I'm going to be good and go for two years wearing a white shirt, the Mormons say. And it's human achievement. That's Cain's religion. God's revelation is what Abel said, divine accomplishment. I need a substitute. I need to kill an animal in my place. I can't save myself. I'm never good enough. Only doing what God says works. That's what Abel did. And that's the, that's the difference. So Satan's religion is the wicked way of Cain. In fact, in your Bible, if you want to see something fascinating, look at 1 John 3. Did you know there's not a single person mentioned in 1 John except one person? Have you ever thought about that? When you read the Bible through and through and through, you start noticing things. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 says this. It says, um, let me find chapter 3, there we go. Not as, and there's the first person mentioned, in the whole epistle, Cain, who was of that wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Why is Cain mentioned? Because Cain is so important. Cain grew up seeing the same thing Abel did. Cain grew up seeing those cherubim with their flaming swords guarding the way to the Garden of Eden. His parents had been thrown out. God put angels there to not let them go back in. Every day when Cain and Abel were playing, they'd get up there and they'd watch those flaming cherubs and they'd go home and say, could you tell us that story again, Mom and Dad, what happened? Well, we were in the garden and we were perfect and following the Lord and then your mother, uh, you know, and Adam went on and on and Eve said, yeah, but you did it too. You know, and so they, but Cain and Abel both were right there in the presence of all that God was doing. And Cain rejected what he knew was true. 
And Abel accepted what he knew was true. And that's what First John, the whole book, is about. The contrast between light and darkness and right and wrong. And so that's what the Lord does. God's revelation is the righteous faith of Abel. That's what Hebrews 11, 4 says, by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he testified that he was righteous and though he be dead, his life still speaks. And that's what Hebrews 11 tells us. God destroyed the whole earth through the flood of Genesis because God only found one family, uh, Noah and his three sons and their wives and his wife. The Lord says that we worship but only his way. And, and even though it was hard, even though it was, did you know for farmers to take your very best animal, the perfect one, and to kill it as a sacrifice was an economic hardship? God says, I want you to offer something to me that's costly. And that's the whole revelation of himself. Uh, the ark portrays eternal security. By the way, uh, the, the more you look at the gospel, you see it cover to cover. How many doorways were there into the ark, by the way? One. And there was no handle on the door. And God left the door open and God shut the door and everybody that was inside the ark was saved and everybody that was outside the ark perished. And the entire ark account in Genesis is a picture that there's only one way of salvation, that God designed it, that you have to come God's way, there's only one way in, and God closes you in and you're secure once you're inside. Did you know not one animal or person died in the ark? Even though they were all packed in there, they were safe through the greatest storm the earth's ever had because God was faithful. And, and that's the picture. The ark portrays eternal salvation. By the way, when we get to Genesis 10, there's Nimrod. He founds Babel. If you study this at all, there's an amazing book by Alexander Hislop called The Two Babylons. And it's a history of paganism. I was talking with one of the young ladies about paganism. Satan's whole plan is, is starting back here at the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 11, Babel's tower, there's this, this ziggurat and they're worshiping the stars and God confuses their language and idolatry starts there and permeates the world. We have no evidence of any idol worship before the Tower of Babel and the worship of the stars and astrology. Pagan religions originate from Babylon. And if you look at, every religion in the world has a mother-son. There is Baal, the, the child, the boy, and Asheroth, the mother. There is Isis and Horus. There is Semiramis. And, you know, if you look in every ancient religion, there is a mother and a son that are worshipped together. And so that's why by the time we come to the 4th century in Rome, all of the pagan religions had a mother-son, kind of a, uh, this mother with the son that she cradles in her arms, the pieta that you see in the Vatican today, is Mary and Jesus. But it was not revolutionary. It's in paganism. It's in the Phoenician religion. It's in the Babylonian religion. It's in the Canaanite religion. It's in the Egyptian religion. It's in all of those religions, this mother-son. And so that's why the Roman Catholic Church took Mary, Jesus, and Mary the mother and Jesus the little son. He's always uh, portrayed, you know, like she's holding him or helping him along. And all that originates, and you can read about that in Babylon. Okay, how does that tie into the end of the world? That's what you're, you're going to get when you get the second half of Revelation. By the time we get to chapter 17 of Revelation, there's one world religion, chapter 17, and one world commercial materialistic system, chapter 18, and God destroys both of them. Um, but why does God give us revelation? Because God wants us to understand the future. That's why the more you see what's going on today, did you know this current pope, um, is he from Argentina or Brazil? I don't know which. He's South American pope. He's a rarity. He is organizing more what we call ecumenical stuff than we've seen in ages. And more and more American Christians are saying that he's a good guy and that, that he is, uh, you know, kind of like a Christian. And yet, what was the very first thing? You guys were alive when he became the Pope. I mean, it was just a few years ago. Do you know what the first words out of his mouth when they made him Pope was? 
His prayer, read it, it's on the internet. He said, Mary, I thank you. Mary? How could she hear him talking from Rome? He thinks Mary's omnipotent. He thinks Mary is omnipresent. He thinks Mary, in fact, last week, last week he was in Ireland, this current pope. He hung a solid gold rosary on Mary's home on this little altar in her home in Ireland. I didn't even know Mary lived in Ireland, but he knows she lived there, and, and he hung a rosary there and prayed to her from there. You say, what's that? God wants us to understand that Satan is going to counterfeit the truth. He's going to have Christians, by the way, Roman Catholics have about 98% orthodox doctrine. Did you know that? They're Trinitarian, they believe in the inspiration of the Bible, uh, they believe in the deity of Christ, they believe in the crucifixion, they believe in the resurrection. Boy, they're just right down the line. But they've added the destructive heresy of works. You know what Paul said? If anybody teaches any other gospel, if they mix the gospel with works, if they mix the gospel with penance, with having to take part in the mass to be saved, to have a priest forgive you, if they do that, they're accursed. They're teaching a false gospel. So God wants us to know the future. And the seven types of churches portray the seven types of believer in stages of history. And I showed you this uh, uh, two days ago. Ephesus is like the early church, the apostolic church. Smyrna is like the suffering church that went through all those waves of suffering. Pergamus is when, after the church was legalized, it merged with all the paganism of Rome. And it became the... the polluted church. Then Thyatira is when the church ruled the world, basically. The Western world, the Roman Catholic Church ruled, and that's what it talks about when we get to Thyatira. And Sardis, by the time we come to the Reformation, the church is dead. But then the missionary era, you know, William Carey and, and C.T. Studd and Hudson Taylor, the 1800 onward, became the missionary era when there was evangelism. But you know, somewhere in there, and I put 1948 because that's the year that the the National Council of Churches and the United Nations both started and Israel became a nation, three things at once, and the computer chip was invented. And that marked a change. And it's almost like the church has become Laodicean. And people are rich, increased with goods, and they don't need God. It also portrays not only the history of the church, but the seven churches portray the seven types of believers that are in every church. There are distracted believers that have lost their first love. There are churches where they're suffering. There are compromised believers who have hidden sins. There are deceived believers who don't know their doctrine. There are stupefied believers who are just, you know, they're kind of not even thinking anymore. There are these impassioned believers that love the Lord. And then there are the uncommitted, lukewarm ones. And that's what's going on. So basically, in Revelation 17 and 18, in the second half of this course, we see the rebellion of religion and materialism being dealt with by God, and we're not going to cover that. But it all started in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel, and basically all religions of the world flow from that. And I want to show you, this is my, my drawing of what happened. Jesus Christ died on the cross. The early church you read about in the New Testament was doing great until it merged with Romanism, and the first sign of the merge was that the first man called himself the Pope, he was Gregory the Great, 590 AD, and he began the false doctrine of purgatory. Do you know what purgatory is? It comes from the Apocrypha, from the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 24, and what it says is that you can offer an offering that will get someone out of hell, actually they're not quite in hell, they're in purgatory, they're in halfway hell, and if you burn a candle and do a couple masses, you can get them slowly out of there. That's how he dealt with people that weren't saved. He said you can get them out through masses, through saying masses. So that was the start of the Roman Catholic Church proper. Then he gave power to emperors, and then there's a lot of history you don't want. They start the uh, masses for money in the 1100s. Indulgences begin. That's what got Luther upset, where, where you could buy time out. You didn't even have to do a mass. You could just give money and, and assure that you would go to heaven. Um, Roman Catholic doctrine gets worse. Uh, they start adoring the host. That means the priest would lift up the bread and say it's the body of Christ. The Council of Trent in 1546 said that, that church dogma is equal with the Bible. And they're still making up doctrine to this day. The Immaculate Conception of Mary, that doctrine didn't start until the Civil War time. 
in 1950, just 68 years ago, the Pope declared that Mary bodily went to heaven, that she was raptured bodily.